Uh, hey everyone, welcome to ASRG World. My name is John Heldreth. Um, before we get started, of course, we are going to be doing a little poll again, just to get people uh, giving some feedback to get some conversation going. Um, please go ahead. Uh, as always, please add your questions into the live chat when we're going through the presentations. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we will uh, be asking the questions. So uh, please in the live chat, tell us where you're coming from. Um, actually, we also have a poll that uh, just like every time we try to understand who's coming from where, who's joining us from all over the world, because ASRG is a world's wide community. Um, it's uh, really interesting to see uh, where everybody is joining from. So please go ahead and go to pollev.com slash ASRG. And we're going to have a few questions here. The first one is, where are you joining us from today? Um, so just you can kind of just click there on your mobile phone or on your computer. Just go ahead and say, yeah, I'm coming from Germany today or I'm coming from the US. Just so everybody can kind of see where people are joining from. Um, so while people are starting to get into the webinar, just go ahead and and quickly say where you're coming from and we'll see it right on the screen as well. Looks like Detroit, Recife, maybe Brasilia, so UK, Germany, Tel Aviv maybe, India. Great, that's, I think that's so amazing that um, people can join from all over the world, get the same information, join the same communities, be a part of the, the experience. So for the people that are just joining us, this is ASRG Worlds. This is our, our fifth webinar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, we usually like to do a poll just to see where everybody's coming from, kind of uh, see who's, who's joining us from where all over the world. Um, if you go to pollev.com, slash ASRG. It's at the top there. And uh, go in there. It's completely anonymous. And um, we don't track anything. If you could just say where you're coming from, and then it automatically shows up. So you can see who might be joining from your area as well. Um, helps us understand who's, who's joining from where as well. So... And then we'll get started just here in a few minutes. All right, I think, um, let's see who's joining from where today. It looks like uh, US, a few places. It looks like Brazil as well. Uh, Sao Paulo, maybe. maybe. Uh, oh man, my geography is bad. So Recife, 
Uh, we got UK, Germany, uh, Romania, uh, Israel, I believe, India. Uh, looks like almost west side of the U.S. as well, as well as east side. Interesting. But we're going to go ahead and start today. I have a few more questions for you to answer before we get into the, the presentation. Um, and the first question is, is actually related to the presentation today. Um, I just want to see how many people here um, understand what the abbreviation IVI means. So if you if you stay at pollev.com slash ASRG, then you can go ahead and uh, just make sure that you know we see where people are um, where where they know that what IVI really means or maybe what they don't know. But this helps uh, the presenter, Ian Tabor, is with us today, and he'll be able to kind of see and judge, okay, yeah, IVI, we understand. A lot of the participants, they, they got the idea uh, or where we need to focus. So um, go ahead. Uh, if you're just joining, go to pollev.com quickly. Just answer the question here. Let's see. Who has an idea about IVI real quick? So the first answer is intelligent vehicle infotainment. Okay. The second answer is information vehicle entertainment. The third one is in vehicle infotainment. And the fourth one is interior van intel. Uh, you know, that sounds like the right answer to me. So. Uh, or the last one is, I have no idea where am I, what's going on, and why am I watching this YouTube video. So, I'm just kidding. So, um, it looks like most of the people are saying in-vehicle infotainment, which is the right answer. I'm glad to see it. Uh, if you chose, I have no idea. It's not a big issue. We are going to cover it today in the presentation. But don't leave pollev.com quite yet. We have one more question for you. And it's basically to understand who has already set up their own vehicle hardware test setup. So I how many of you have you know taken a piece of hardware well that's interesting um and <laughs> i think we i think i changed this answer or changed this uh question however whatever who has set up their own vehicle hardware test setup the first answer is yes i have a complete electronic uh, <laughs> vehicle electronics on my wall right now Yes, I have a small test bench where I can test an ECU or two. Uh, I have all the parts, but they're still in the box right next to my computer here. Uh, no, I have better things to do with my time. Um, and the last answer is no, but I would like to give it a try. So, of course, the first answer is yes, you have everything done. And this, this thing is awesome. And basically, the car is completely rebuilt. So, we'll just wait a few minutes until you guys can, so you guys can see the the answers on the screen here, and then we'll jump right into the ASRG presentation today. Um, we have a really cool presentation today from Ian Tabor. Uh, he is the lead of Car Hacking Village. Uh, CHV in the UK. So um, we'll we'll get to him here in just a minute. But it looks like um, that 29% say that they do have they, they've done a lot with uh, uh, electronics uh, in in vehicles and have their own hardware test set up. 20% uh, or so have small ECU test benches. Um, no one has parts, but still in the box. And 7% uh, has said, well, 
I have better things to do with my time. But everybody looks like 53% is interested to try this out. So this talk is going to be today about that. So really interested uh, about Ian's talk later on. Um, before we jump into Ian's talk, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, so, and go into what is ASRG quickly. Uh, if PowerPoint is going to cooperate, let's try this out. So um, today, welcome to ASRG Worlds. Um, good evening, good morning, wherever you might be in the world today. Thank you for joining ASRG Worlds. We have really a great presentation tonight. Uh, Ian Tabor is on the line with us today and he is, he's the lead of Car Hacking Village in the UK with us today. He's, he's always doing something interesting. So glad to have him here with us. But before we jump into Ian's talk, we're going to talk a little bit about what ASRG is and what we're trying to accomplish uh, in ASRG. So first of all, let me introduce myself. Myself, um, my name is John Heldreth. I'm the founder of automotive security uh, community called ASRG or Automotive Security Research Group. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, during the day, I work for Porsche Engineering as the product security lead. Um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you can contact me on Slack, whatever. I'll show you the links later, uh, and they will be in the comments after the YouTube video. So welcome to the fifth ASRG webinar in this uh, Corona time. Uh, my name is, again, John Heldreth, founder of the Automotive Security Research Group. For those that don't know what ASRG is, um, I just make a quick overview. Uh, I'm sure most of you have already heard this from me a million times. But ASRG is a nonprofit company focusing on the advancement of the automotive security industry. This is a community for you to learn, to support and advance our understanding of bringing secure automotive products to the market. In security, we all have the same goals, and this is to keep our customers, our families, and our friends' data safe and secure, which can only be achieved together. So uh, ASRG is here for you, the members. And uh, if you have any questions, please contact us. Uh, our email address is hello at asrg.io. Um, at ASRG, we focus on three things, uh, knowledge, networking, and collaboration. Um, knowledge, uh, we're trying to focus on ensuring that people that are working in the security solutions in vehicles are making the best decisions, recommendations, and integrations. We need to understand where to find information, learn, and build up our own competencies in the industry. Regarding networking, if you can't find the information, then having a network of professionals is very important. They might know, they might know where to look, have the experience or recommendations, we can't know everything ourselves, so it's always nice when we have a community, we're much stronger together. So, And the last one, of course, is collaboration. Um, this are, there are many projects going on, um, and at ASRG we have many projects like threat intelligence, uh, knowledge management, and so on. If you're interested to collaborate and work in a project team together with other members um, to accomplish a goal, please also let us know. This is really interesting stuff right now. So um, moving on, ASRG is, uh, is growing. So we have currently 3,500 members in 22 locations worldwide. 
we are in what almost all of the continents and um, here you can see all of the different locations that we have around the world. There is one missing here. Uh, that's Bucharest in Romania. So uh, I need to add that. But you can see here Detroit, Pittsburgh, Dayton, San Francisco in the US, Recife in Brazil, Cairo in Egypt, Tel Aviv in Israel, Oxford in the UK, um, Stuttgart, Munich, Berlin, Rheingebiet near Frankfurt in Germany, as well as three locations in Romania, Cluj-Napoyoka, Josh, and uh, Bucharest. Um, then Bangalore and Delhi in India, Tokyo, Shanghai, Singapore, and Sydney. If you don't see a location near you, don't worry. Um, because we can always create one, just please send me an email, hello at asrg.io, and get in touch with me. We'll s just talk about how it, how it works and what makes sense, and uh, then see what type of community you can build uh, locally. Very good. We have many ways to communicate, but the two main communication platforms are Slack and Telegram. So if you guys do uh, want to join the conversation, join the, the uh, discussions, Slack and Telegram here, the QR codes are presented. Uh, use your device to scan those quickly. Uh, I will put the links also in the comments afterwards. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter and social media like LinkedIn. Um, these two are the main social media channels for ASRG. We post a lot of news, a lot of uh, uh, interesting topics. So follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Again, the links will be there afterwards. So because of Corona, we've switched our uh, model instead of doing face-to-face -face meetings every time we are doing webinars and we have lots of webinars planned for you so uh, this week we have Ian Tabor he, I'll introduce him in two seconds but next week uh, on May 21st actually I think it's May 20th now because the 21st is a holiday in Germany so please keep that in mind next week is on Wednesday uh, we have the Thriver t uh, Cyber Threat Intelligence, and it's Top Gun style. It's an interesting presentation. It's themed on Top Gun, the, the American movie. So uh, Threat Quotient will be here. Marcus Auer will be presenting. Really interesting. May 28th, Dynamic Trust Models for Mobility During Life Cycle. Mir Mirko Ross from Osvin will be here presenting an interesting view of how trust models uh, need to be for mobility over the lifetime. June 4th, Telematic Control Unit in Security from Jofra Paul, Paola. Uh, he's, he was working at Vodafone. This is really going to be an interesting talk. Come uh, listen if you're interested in TCU or telematic control unit security. Um, very interesting stuff here. And on June 11th, we have ISO 21434 by example with Bastian Crook from Etimis. He is going to be taking the ISO 21434, going through it, and actually showing by example. Uh, using, I think, risk management, uh, how to fulfill the ISO 21434. So it's going to be a great discussion. We also have more webinars to come. They don't fit on the slide. Uh, check back often. Check on the website, asrg.io. We will post everything there. Very good. Uh, also, we do need sponsors. Uh, unfortunately, ASRG does cost money to run. Uh, we make it free for all the members, uh, 
but it does cost money, so we, we would like to ask for your support. Uh, we do need sponsors, people to give money, to, um, to support with resources. So if either your company or if you also want to get more involved, please let me know. Send us an email at hello at asrg.io and we will get in contact. Very good, guys. So that's my 10-minute presentation there about ASRG. I hope it wasn't too long. Um, so we're going to... I have the honor of um, introducing Ian Tabor, but before we go into the presentation, if you guys have questions during the presentation, please write them in the chat window. Um, and at the end of the presentation, then... I will ask Ian these questions and have a little conversation to um, uh, about the topics or the questions that you guys had during the presentation, all right? So without further ado, Mr. Ian Tabor, the lead of Car, Hack, uh, Car Hacking Village UK. So Ian, welcome to ASRG World. Uh, thank you, John. Um, uh, here is my uh, presentation from an IVI in a box to a car in a box. It goes through uh, a finding I had on my own vehicle a few years ago now. Um, and um, the fun or not fun that I had trying to actually get a IVI in the box working and then a car in a box working after that. Uh, On to my first slide. Um, who am I? Well, you could say I'm the ultimate car hacker because a few years ago now, I actually built this kit car here. It's based on Ford running gear from 1990 Sierra. If you're a European, you would know what that is. If you're American, it's a rear wheel drive thing, um, front engine, rear wheel drive, very light, very quick. Um, the car I'm going to be talking about is nothing like this. This only has three ECUs, two of which I built myself. Um, it's like a Caterham um, 7, but it's a Tiger Supercat. Um, the three ECUs are the electronic distributor, the uh, Mega Squirt 2, which does the spark and injection, and the little box you can see in the top right hand corner there, um, which is a data logger that I made from an Arduino. Um, that interfaces over CAN with the Mega Squirt to get the details of what's happening on the engine so I can log it and check it at a later date. There is a little disclaimer down the bottom there. This work was completed on my own time on my own vehicle and was nothing to do with my current or previous employer. Um, the second line also says, if you brick your own vehicle, please do not blame me. Car hacking is done at your own risk. I say this because um, two years ago now, I, try, I tried to do some testing or some uh, logging of some data on my Jag that I had at the time had a 2017 Jaguar XE. Um, I make my own CAN hardware, so I plugged it in, turned the ignition on, the, um, the dashboard lit up like a Christmas tree, and then said the um, uh, warning words of cannot find gearbox. At that point, I'm thinking, oh no, what have I done? So um, turn the ignition off, unplug the cable, turn the ignition back on, still cannot find the gearbox. It's like, oops, uh, I think I broke it. Um, at the next, at that point, I'm thinking, how do I get it to reset? Well, I'll go and get my tools and I'll disconnect the battery. So I disconnected the battery, plugged the battery back in, got back in, got inside, turned the ignition on, still can't find gearbox. Oops. Um, well, the dealer at the time knew I knew about cars because my kit car and things, etc. So it's like, okay, now what do I try? Well, I'll try disconnecting the battery for a little bit longer. Um, so what I did is disconnected the battery for about 10 minutes, put it back on, got in the vehicle, turned the ignition on, no lights, no error message, no can't find gearbox. By this time, it was about 11 o'clock at night. So I thought I'll, I'll call it a day next morning, get in the vehicle, drive off, start accelerating, keep accelerating, keep accelerating. The XE um, has got a automatic ZF gearbox and it lost all the settings and forgotten how to change gear. Um, it took three and a half weeks to learn how to change gear properly again. 
Um, the stupid thing was, six weeks after that, I did exactly the same test with exactly the same bit of hardware. The only problem is this time I knew exactly how to fix it. Um, for my day job, I was a network security architect. I'm now a sort of automotive security engineer for a consultancy company, but um, that's got nothing to do with this. So with respect to car hacking, uh, a, few now, a few years ago now, I found the issue with my car. Um, I did my talk at um, DC 4420, B-Sides London Rookie Track, and DEFCON 26 Car Hacking Village. Web browsing from a car, what's the worst that can happen? It goes into the, in greater detail in what I found in the vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. After that, I was um, invited to a bug crash, bug bash live hacking event in 2018 and I returned in 2019 where they take you out to America, you then go and play with some real cars, find out what you can break and then they may or may not pay out. Um, I did find on the first one, I did find a very interesting issue with, shall we say the radar sensor in that if you take the radar sensor out, you can get to the CAN bus right behind it and you can then potentially lock or unlock the car um, some vehicles are susceptible to this, others aren't, but um, I need to go and test all the other ones that have this. Tested a few, one is, a couple aren't, but I need to check them. Um, last year at DEF CON, I was part of a car hacking panel for Bug Crowd with Cyber Gibbons and Spectres. I was also asked to go to Auto Isaac last year for a car hacking vulnerable disk vulnerability disclosure process panel um, where we had um, OEMs asking about how that sort of would work in a automotive environment to get them more involved. And now for my sins, I now run the Car Hacking Village UK. Last year I did, uh, I think it was 12 or 13 events. Um, most of those B-sides I did take the car in a box to Amsterdam, which was fun getting it through customs, but um, we'll come on to that one. Um, this year, I was meant to be doing quite a few um, B-sides events, but as we, as this coronavirus thing has broken the world, um, most of them have either been postponed or um, cancelled until further notice. Uh, but I have actually been asked to take my car in a box to India, Australia, Brazil, DEFCON in America, uh, a couple of other places, I can't remember. Um, but onto the actual details of the vehicle in question. So in 2015, bought this Citroen DS5 1955 limited edition thing. It was basically the top of the range DS5. For some strange reason, I like Citroens. Um, it had all the toys, all the bells and whistles, um, one of which was a seven inch touchscreen in the middle of the dashboard in which you could tether to your car over, uh, tether to your phone over Bluetooth or uh, Wi-Fi and surf the internet, which is great, wonderful. Uh, when you do that though, um, if you end map in the other direction, you find four ports open, um, 23, which is Telnet, um, 111, which is RPC bind, um, 3333, which I'm not too sure what it is, and uh, 20,000, which is DNP3, which is a um, industrial control system um, protocol, which allegedly gives you direct access to the CAN bus using the correct format message. I still haven't found out how to correctly format that message myself, um, but, uh, being a network engineer, um, I decided to tell it my own head unit. Um, at that point, I was not prompted for any authentication or anything. You have full access to a file system in which you can then copy the contents of the uh, file system either out by a USB in the middle of the dashboard or over FTP by mapping a path. So that's a bit bad. Within those files, there's some SQL-like databases. Um, three of them are quite interesting. One is your GPS history, one is your phone book history, and the other one is your call history. So um, if someone's got access to that, they know where you've been, where you live, what your phone numbers are, etc. So I disclosed this to the manufacturer, 
um, and their, their, their comment was, well, it's up to the um, user to make sure their Wi-Fi is secure. And it was like, well, the issue is not with the Wi-Fi, the issue is with the head unit listening on port 23. So I tried to explain that, um, okay, your car, um, your battery is flat on your phone and you want to go to the cinema in the evening. So you pull into McDonald's, um, you tether onto McDonald's Wi-Fi. If they don't have host isolation, someone in McDonald's car park can be on the same Wi-Fi, scan the network, find your car, find port 23 open, have a look around, copy off the files, and now they know where you live and that you're going to be away from home because you're at McDonald's and go and rob you or something. And they were like, ooh, that's a bad idea. Their fix was to disable the Wi-Fi, not disable the telnet. I think they've later on disabled telnet in later versions of the software. Um, but I did also bring up the fact that um, the French president drives around in one of these um, vehicles or something very similar. And um, is it not a matter of national security? Because um, there are probably some smarter cookies in the world that could probably get through the Wi-Fi security and find out where he's been or where he's going. Um, at that point, I decided to, um, I sold the vehicle and bought my Jag. Um, I then decided, I think there's a bit more to this. So I bought a head unit from a scrapyard, um, the screen and the head unit um, in the bottom corner there. And when I actually went to purchase it, I had to ask them to include the cables because we don't have the cables and getting the cables is a bit of a pain. And they were like, well, you've got the cables in the vehicle you're putting it in. Well, actually, I haven't because I'm going to put it in my kit car. So they reluctantly gave me the cables. They then said that I had no um, warranty because it's not going in the vehicle it's coming from. So took it home, put 12 volts to it, nothing happened. So um, I had to then purchase all those parts you can see on the screen there um, to actually get the thing working. Um, the head unit itself is from a Citroen DS3, which is the baby brother of the Citroen DS5. It's got the same vulnerability. The one I have there doesn't have GPS, but you can still get into it and look around the file system. Um, but I had to then purchase the other components you can see here. So you've got the instrument cluster, the wiring loom under the dashboard, the steering wheel switches, the body control module, the key, the lock, etc. Uh, while you're getting the body control module keys and lock, always get the engine ECU as well, because they're normally tied together. Um, all of that probably cost me about 500 pound. Um, at that point, I then um, tried to get everything working so that I didn't need the rest of the car to actually operate the head unit itself. And then I could demo the um, vulnerability out, out and about on the road. So I got myself an Arduino with the CAN bus adapter. Um, I then reverse engineered some of the um, messages to find out what five messages are required to turn on the device itself. Um, I then packaged it all up into the case here, you can see. So I have a now um, a head unit in a box. Um, you probably can't see it, but on the top here, there is the Wi-Fi accredited logo. When I first purchased the head unit itself, um, plugged it all in, got it on working. Only the Bluetooth stack was operational. In the last couple of weeks, I have actually managed to get the Wi-Fi operational again. Um, it involves editing some of those um, SQLite files within the head unit rehashing them to create a hash file and then uploading it so i now can then do the attacks slightly easier over wi-fi rather than bluetooth personal area network um so where was I? yes um so that can operate on its own so at that point it, uh, i sort of parked it for a bit but then i went over to the um bug bash event and when we found the issue with the radar sensor and being able to lock and unlock the vehicle, um, the vendor in question paid out a five figure sum to the three of us. Um, we shared that and that gave me some extra um, cash to um, um, have spare, shall we say. Don't tell the missus. Um, I then decided, well, I've got quite a lot of the car, in, car already, so I'll try and build a car in a box. My inspiration was, um, if you've ever seen it at DEF CON or any other car hacking village conferences, is Grimm's 3PO. 
this is all of the electronics from a 2012 Ford Focus. Um, attached some board with some wires between them to actually keep it operational, but it doesn't think it's a fully working car. It's just all the ECUs attached to power supply, and you can make alarms go off by squirting the right messages to it. So I decided I'd go and get the rest of the parts to, to the um, vehicle that I had, and I purchased all these other components here. Um, as you can see, there is um, throttle body, main fuse box, which has an ECU inside it, uh, steering rack, engine ECU, ABS ECU, pedal, um, some plugs here for some of the sensors. I'd already had the switch, cl um, switch cluster, an instrument cluster, and there's the steam powered laptop that runs a Chinese copy of the um, hardware to manage the Citroen um, electronics and erase codes and things. Problem is it can't actually work on the latest version of hardware because you need to be online all the time to do that. And then it doesn't work because the thing's steam powered and a bit slow. So um, actually getting this into a box is a bit of a pain. You have to play with things like wiring looms. Okay, here is the wiring loom for my kit cars main ECU mega squirt. There is a DB37 um, for all the connections and um, 26 connections are connected, of which six are ground and there's about 20 other connections. It's not a simple engine, but it runs batch injection, uh, wasted spark, single O2 sensor, and it's got air temperature, water temperature, um, crank position center, uh, position center, sensor and fuel pump uh, etc as you can see they're not that complicated in the scheme of things um the ecu that i well the vehicle that i have the um, electronics from is actually a peugeot 208 um, and it's a three-cylinder um a one liter three-cylinder with um sequential injection sequential ignition dual variable valve timing which means it's got two lots of sensors and two lots of actuators it's got dual o2 sensors it's got electronic pedal electronic throttle etc uh, if you look in the middle there that big block is the ecu itself on back there are two 53-way connectors and a 32-way connector and i think nearly every one of those pins is actually connected um, there's not many that aren't so you've potentially got 138 pins to connect up um getting those connectors you can get them but they're not cheap um if you can cut, cut them off the loom that you've already got but if you, if you don't want to do that you can buy them from mouser but they're not very cheap um the wiring looms here as you can see come from the pojo citroen um service website where you can log on pay them some money and then you can download some um of the uh, looms uh, diagrams uh, the only problem is every diagram is a functional diagram so this is the engine diagram you then get a light diagram for side lights you get a light diagram for indicators you get a light diagram for stop light you get a light diagram for reversing lights it's a bit tedious and it's very very difficult to actually try and work out what every pin in the loom does so when you're playing around and actually trying to um wire it up or cut down the massive loom you've got it is quite a challenge shall we say um the next challenge you've got is actually getting the engine to think it's a working engine um as i said it's a three cylinder um dual overhead cam it's got two um cam sensors on on the end here um are the um lobes that go in front of the cam sensors um, they produce a certain waveform. There is a, uh, also a cam se uh, crank sensor at the bottom of the engine on the back of the flywheel, which has a 62 minus one configuration. Um, what I did was using a bit of software called Ardu Stim. Um, it's an Arduino Nano and a couple of transistors on that little green board there. Um, and then you, you feed it the waveform and it then makes the engine think that it's actually working. If you can see there, you've got two turns of the crank for every one turn of the camshaft, and the camshafts are slightly out of phase. 
predominantly because you're looking at two different sides of the same cam, uh, two different sides of the two different cams. Um, those little PCBs, if anybody wants one, I have loads. Just send me an email or direct message me on Twitter. Um, I have no problem sending them. Just cover the cost of postage. Um, there are some other um, potentiometers and things used on the car in the box as well for the temperature sensor and the fuel gauge. You twist the temperature sensor, it makes the um, temperature, temperature sensor reading go up and down on the cluster. Again, same with the fuel gauge. Uh, on that diagram there, D0 is cr uh, crank, D1 is inlet, D2 is exhaust, I believe. Um, the next sensor you have to actually get working um, is the lambda sensor. Um, the lambda sensor detects whether your engine is running rich or lean. Um, it's basically a AC wave on a DC offset. Um, and what you can do is use this circuit here with a 555 timer and the correctly um, numbered um, capacitors and resistors, and it will generate the correct waveform to make it that think that the lambda sensor is working. The other part of the lambda sensor is the heated circuit, heater circuit. Uh, in which you have to make sure it drains the, the correct amount of current that it would drain if the heater was actually connected, which is about one to one and a half amps. So what you need to do is have some really large wire round resistors um, connected into the loom where the uh, where the um, heat circuit would normally be. I have these on my car in the box. They're out the way. I tell people don't touch them. They get hot. And normally by the end of the day, someone has gone and tried to touch them and potentially burnt themselves more for you. Um, the last of the sensors to actually test, um, to actually fall, is the ABS wheel speed sensors to actually make the car think that the wheels are going round. This box here um, is the second iteration of this that I built. Um, we have, again, an Arduino Nano with a uh, CAN bus transceiver and a little Arduino stim board here with a slightly bigger transist transistor on it, which does pulse width modulation of the motor in the middle. That spins a disc here, which is would normally be on your um, axle on your vehicle to tell it that your car is going round. Um, you'd only normally have one sensor in each corner. All I've done is put all four sensors on the same um, uh, reluctor wheel and the little screen there shows that the top is the speed you require, the bottom is the speed that is currently reading back off the OBD2 port um, off the CAN bus, so it knows how fast to actually try and make the wheel spin to actually um, get the car thinking it's moving. Um, there, you don't actually have to have all four of the connect, um, sensors connected, but you need two out of the four working. So if I have all four, there's a bit of redundancy there because if one's not quite lined up because it's moved in transit, we're fine. Hopefully it should be okay. Um, if it goes below two, what normally happens is I have to get the um, laptop out, uh, the steam powered laptop and reset the ECU. Um, I don't normally take that with me to a conference, so I try not to. Um, but uh, underneath the bottom there is a little um, potentiometer for adjusting the speed. And like I said, it will then try and tr track with the um, speed that is coming from the um, CAN bus itself. Uh, so onto the CAN networks on the vehicle. Um, there actually are four different CAN networks on the um, Peugeot 208. Um, there is your normal um, high-speed CAN on the left-hand side in orange and red, which goes from your OBD2 port through, through the body control module to your uh, ABS ESP, power steering, uh, engine ECU, and the main fuels box. Um, that is sort of segregated via the body control module. You then have two low speed CAN buses, which one of them has the steering control ECU, which does your light and wiper switches. Um, it also has the airbag ECU, which is not in my car in the box because really don't want someone to try and fuzz an airbag ECU or set an airbag off and I have to fill a form in and on the right hand side there you can also see there is an additional OBD2 port 
for you to directly tap into that bus there. Uh, on that bus, what you can do is you can um, forge the messages what would normally come from the steering control ECU and make it do disco mode. We'll show you that in a bit. You then have another low speed bus um, in the two different shades of blue, which has the body control module, instrument cluster, the matrix within the instrument cluster, which is a separate ECU, which would normally show your um, GPS directions, like turn right at the corner, etc. Again, there is the IVI on that one and another additional OBD2 port. You can also do silly things by squatting messages on that bus. Um, down the bottom there between the IVI and the screen, there is a fourth CAN bus that runs at high speed, which I believe is used for the touch screen on the IVI. I'm actually planning on adding another ECU to this. Um, which is a parking uh, reverse parking ECU. Um, I haven't quite worked out where it's going to go yet because I've only received it last week. I've not really had time to um, play with it, but that should be fun. And I'm, and I'm also going to be connecting a reversing camera as well, which goes gets plugged into the head unit. But on to what it actually looks like. Here is my car in a box, in a box. Um, the big box at the bottom is the main part. The uh, record box has the ABS sensor in. And then on the right there is the IVI in a box. Um, this is what it looks like um, in the boot of my new car. It was slightly tighter when it had the Jag in the, the box in the middle there. The large one would be the only thing that went in the boot of the car. That was fun when I was going over to um, Amsterdam pull into customs, excuse me, sir, can you open the boot? Okay, what's in the box? A car, what, a toy car? No, a whole car. I then had to explain what was in there, show them pictures of it out and out on the table, explain that I do security research and I show people how to do, um, make, make sure cars are secure. And he had that sort of confused look on his face that he didn't really want to um, fill a form in. So it's like, uh, yeah, thank you, sir, on your way. Uh, I didn't actually get caught on the way back, but um, thank God for that. Um, so next is, uh, again, we've got the picture again of the ABS sensor simulator and the IVI in the box. And finally, here is the actual car in the box itself. Uh, if anyone knows, P it's called PD0 because P for Peugeot and D0 is um, 208 in hex. So that is why that is that. Um, so most of the things on the left-hand box are to do with the engine and the movement of the vehicle. You've got the ABS EC on the left. Above it here, you have the Ardu Stim device, which is simulating the crank and cam sensors. If you look slightly above it, where that white bit of plastic um, is, you've got some indicators indicating the injector. Um, some indicators indicating the coils. Um, at the top there, you have the throttle body, the 555 simulator, the oil pressure and water temperature sensors, um, clutch switch, brake switch, uh, accelerator pedal. Um, there's the light board that shows what the lights are doing. In the middle here, we have the main fuse box, body control module, um, all this unplugs. Um, there's only like three wires that go between the two halves um, for transit, and the, the right hand side sort of fits up on on top of the left hand side upside down. Um, make sure you get a decent power supply if you do try this. Um, a 12 volt ATX power supply will work, but a car normally needs about 14 volts. Um, that little box there on the left is a washer bottle. Um, that's actually connected. The original plan was to connect the whiskey bottle to it. And if you made it squirt out water from either the front or rear connector for the windscreen, you got to drink whatever it spat out. The only problem is whiskey and cars are sort of frowned upon. And also every time you did it, it did about half a litre. So it'd start, actually start getting slightly expensive. Um, finally down the bottom here is where your steering column switches are. You've got your um, lights adjustment. You've got your disable your ABS and key switch. I do actually have the remote key with RF on it as well. 
and the radio functions still work. So you can still take the key out, lock and unlock the vehicle, etc. Um, at this point, um, where, where I am here, I'd say this cost me about £2,000 to build. Um, and that was mainly by buying parts off of eBay um, in the different bits. Um, had to uh, get a couple of bits from junkyards and things as well, and some odd parts from Mouser um, and some electronic part um, components and stuff to connect things together. Um, I could have probably made it slightly cheaper. Um, the only problem with that is if you buy a vehicle, you think I'll get rid of the bits that are left. Okay, yes, you can sell some of those bits, but selling stuff on eBay is just a hassle. Um, but on to the next one. Here is a video. It'll work if you can see it. Um, there's me adjusting the rev counter with the Arju stim. And in a second, you'll hear the whining from the motor or the ABS sensor. Um, it's currently going at 70 something mile an hour. Uh, all the way up to 143 mile an hour. If you've ever driven in a Peugeot 208, it's about the size of a Ford Fiesta. You probably don't want to be doing 148 mile an hour. It's not fun. Um, it probably rattles itself to bits. Um, on to my next slide. Here is a little device I built when I first started the car hacking village. Yeah. It's actually more a business card for myself um, that I use. Um, it's a nano can, which is an Arduino nano on one side. And on the back is a MCP2515 transceiver, which means you can build your own can adapter for less than five pound or five dollars, depending on which currency you're in. It's actually cheaper for you to buy the parts from China singularly and get them mailed to you than me buying them in bulk and trying to sell them on because when I buy them in bulk, they get stuck in customs and I then have to pay the VAT and import tax, etc. If anyone wants a PCB of these, I have quite a few spare. Um, I've always got some. Give me a shout either on um, direct message me, email me through SRG or um, LinkedIn, etc. Um, the default sketch that will, uh, can be used um, basically works as a serial port and um, will receive the data and just display what's going on. You can reprogram it to make it an SL can adapter. The SL can adapter is a bit flaky though on some of the cheap Chinese clone nanos, um, mainly because um, they don't uh, initiate the COM port correctly, which is a bit of a pain. Um, however, I will show you another one I'm, I've been working on in the meantime. So this is using the Arduino serial port IDE. This is using PuTTY. It just shows you what's going on on the bus. Here is a second one I built, or one of the other ones I built. Um, this is a tiny can adapter. As you can see, it's not much bigger than a couple of two pound, uh, a couple of one pound coins. Uh, this is a AT Tiny 6014 chip, um, which is the one on the far left. The large one in the middle is a CAN controller and on the right is a CAN transceiver. Um, this basically um, will do the same as a nano CAN, but um, it can be also used for surreptitious reasons. So that there is attached to a OBD2 plug, which can go in the OBD2 socket in a vehicle. Um, I have programmed one of these to go in my car in a box so that when the car gets to a certain speed, it then goes into disco mode. Uh, when you then bring it back to zero, once you stop the vehicle, it turns it off. I do know someone that has a Peugeot 208, but they wouldn't let me do it on his, his car because I couldn't guarantee I wasn't going to break it. Yeah, that's true. Here is the second iteration of the tiny can. And the right hand side there is a USB to serial adapter, which does initiate correctly using SL can and socket can which means you can use can utils on um, Linux to interface with it, or you can use things like Savvy Can um, to interface with it. Um, it actually works quite well. Um, I haven't actually published these on GitHub yet. I will at some point once I get around to it. Um, so 
uh, here is a video of uh, what I call disco mode. Um, this is basically forging the messages on the steering wheel switch system so that it thinks they're changing really, really quickly. When I first did it, um, I actually had it flashing the um, main beams, which uses a relay. And if you flash a relay really quickly, it causes minor problems, as in it arcs and then welds itself on, and then you can't turn the lights off and you have to replace the relay. Uh, and now, so onto my final slide, I would like to say thank you um, first, commonly to the Grim Cyber team for helping me build the car in the box, to the Car Hacking Village team for helping me also um, in my bringing car hacking to the UK and the wider Europe. Um, and finally to um, John for letting me present here on the ASRG world. Um, I was actually meant to be at Eastside Stuttgart next week with John, but it's a different story. Um, my contact details are there. If anyone wants to get in touch, um, say hello. If you want any of the PCBs, again, just give me a shout and I'll send them. I don't charge anything, just cover postage. As long as you're not in the back of nowhere, I might not even charge you that. Um, but postage does take a while at the moment because of things at the moment. Um, anyway, John, any questions? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Ian. That was really interesting. Ex the way that you put together the, the PDO, that's really interesting. Uh, so first of all, um, if you guys do have questions for Ian, please go ahead and write them in the, the live chat. Um, Ian, I do have a few questions for you while people are starting to uh, put their questions in. Um, do you have any recommendations for people that would like to do the same thing? I mean, what, what should we uh, do or, or not do? um depends um, uh, the cost of what you're going to do depends on what vehicle you want to use um i chose peugeot 208 because it's similar to a ds3 which just happened to have the same head unit as the ds5 i had if you actually look it up the peugeot uh, the ds3 is actually more like a peugeot 207 but i didn't find out until later after i spent quite a bit of money on the parts so it was like i'm going with it now it works sort of um, the only bit that doesn't work is if i put speakers on the head unit it just insanely beeps every 30 seconds to say haha you've not actually got me coded correctly <laughs> i think I, I think i found a way around that um but if you're going to try and do a whole car in a box try and get a whole car um try and get something recent so it's got more ecus than not um but if you're if you, if you want to do it, try and get something that's had a rear end shunt because most of the ECUs on, on cars are at the front of the vehicle because that's where most of the intelligence is, unless you go something like a BMW or something where there's an ECU in every light around the vehicle, which just gets stupid. Um, I think PD0 has, I think, eight or nine ECUs in total, whereas the average high-end BMW, Audi or something, has 60 to 80, possibly more. Um, the biggest pain in the butt when actually trying to build it is if you're doing it from a car, the first thing you want is the last thing you take out of the vehicle. Because the first thing you want is the wiring loom. What's the last thing to get out of the vehicle? The wiring loom. Because you've got to take all the interior out, it unplug everything. When you do unplug everything, make sure you note on every plug what it was plugged into. Because when I built mine, I had a wiring loom for an engine. I had to work out which port was which center, which was great fun. You either have to get out the um, uh, multimeter and try and trace it back through the wiring diagrams. And when the wiring diagrams are written in French, it gets a bit fun. Or you then just have to play by every sensor on the car and then try and work out which of those 42 different connectors this sensor plugs into, assuming you've got the right sensor for the right year for the right vehicle. Um, if you are going to do it, give me a shout. I can always help. Um, I have assisted a couple of people around the world in doing something similar. 
Um, there's one currently being built in the Philippines by Jay Turler, um, who runs the um, car hacking village in the Philippines. He also works with Bug Crowd, um, doing some automotive stuff. Um, there's another chap that I was helping in America. I uh, can't mention him because it's one of the OEMs. Um, I was also asked by an OEM to help them build uh, a car in a box. Well, not an OEM, a tier one. Um, but at the time, I was just about to start a new job, so I couldn't actually do the job for them. Um, but uh, that's quite interesting because they produce the chips that go in the ECUs, but they never actually get anything at the other end because yeah. they just develop their own dev board and they wanted something to actually show how secure their hardware is. So they actually asked me to have a look at my car in a box to find out what, how I built it, what I'd done and how I got to where I was. Um, so yes, it's it's an interesting challenge. Um, also have a very, very uh, understanding missus or significant <laughs> other because you've got half a car over the floor in your dining room and she walks in and trips up over it and throws your dinner all over you. Yeah, you get in trouble pretty quick. Um, don't <laughs> laugh, sure. it happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is there is there something that people shouldn't do? Uh, you know, like, um, what, what, what did you do that you were like, oh, man, I wish I had knew, known that before? Um when you're trying to build something like with the whole car you need to get certain parts of the vehicle that actually come from the same vehicle um in my case the body control module the lock the key and the engine ecu are all coded specifically together so if you can't get them all from the same vehicle you're going to have some fun basically trying to reprogram them to make them talk to each other um you can go on ebay and buy a complete lock set and ECU set which contains all those parts or the um, the other thing to do if you're in somewhere like um, America is go and go on one of the places where you can go and basically pick your own um, in the UK they don't exist as much as they used to um, from a breakage yard because health and safety Nazis have got in the way and you're not allowed anywhere near a vehicle I remember going I remember going into a scrapyard and saying have you got this switch for a Peugeot 208 and he said, no, I don't. And it's like, uh, see it out the window. It's there. I don't mind going out there and climbing up and getting it. Like, you're not allowed in the yard. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would try and get everything off the same vehicle. Um, if you can also get the wiring plugs, because the wiring plugs are not, shall we say, easy to get hold of. You can get them, but they're not cheap. Um, Mouser will sell you some of the wiring plugs. But uh, the plastic thing just with the plug on its own is about 40 US dollars. You then have to buy three different types of pins to actually plug into it. And then you have to buy the plastic shell that goes over it. And then you have to buy the crimp tool that is used for that specific um, type of connector. And it's just grief. Um, if you can cut down another loom and extend it, um, that's slightly easier. But again, if you don't know how, if you don't know one end of a solder line to, to the other, probably not a good idea to try and attempt it, um, unless you like having lots of wire in the back of the box. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and oh, one more question from my side. This this would be something amazing for us to do in ASRG, I believe. Um, there's nothing better than to learn from how a car is working than having all the parts and trying to put it back together. Um, like you were saying, uh, you got most of your parts on eBay. Is there another source or another interesting source? I mean, I'm in Germany, but in the US or in the UK where you um, that you found a good source to get parts? Um, break is your will depend, depend depends where you are in the world um depends on what your um rules are on recycling of vehicles and things but yeah you can normally go to a breaker shard or you can buy um 
sort of wrecked vehicles from places like Copart. Um, if you've seen, there's some YouTube channels where they go and buy cars from Copart and then they do them up and make them roadworthy again and then flip them on and sell them for lots of money. Um, so you can do it that way. Um, again, try to own it, try to get something that had um, a rear end shunt rather than a front end shunt because most of most vehicles, most of the electronics are up the front rather than the rear. Um, if it's slightly damaged on the windows and things, it doesn't really matter because you don't really need those parts. Um, so I don't know what it's like in Europe with regard to recycling vehicles, but the UK, um, most breakage yards don't actually allow you any near the vehicles anymore. I remember when I was 18 a few years ago now that you'd go around there, climb up four, four high, you'd be sitting inside a vehicle that's moving and you're like, oops, a bit dodgy, but that's what you did um, but yeah um yeah and, and unless you know someone in the family that's had an accident and doesn't want to claim on their insurance <laughs> take their car off them for a, a, a small fee um again it's um depends how you come across it um, okay very cool um so I think this is something we should do in ASRG for sure, but um, we need to find a way to put it online. Uh, you know, I, 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 I have remote access to it, or I did the other week for um, Hack in the Box Amsterdam, or Hack in the Box Lockdown, what it was called, um, in that I had some Raspberry Pis attached to um, the CAN buses, and people couldn't have remote access to it. It's not permanently set up in my front room. My missus would kill me if it was. Um, but it can be arranged for people to have a play if need be. Um, I'm probably going to be setting up something similar for DEF CON this year because that's now now only going to be in virtual space. Mm -hmm. So I should have PDO set up um, online for the period of DEF CON four days um, or remote hack fun. Um, is that quite interesting because when I did it, other people found messages that I hadn't even realized actually do the things that they actually do. So it's like, is that the rev counter? And it's like, mm, actually, yes, it is. Like, Oops, I've never found that on that bus before because I've never tried. Um, so, yes, you can do it. Um, the way it works is I have a webcam pointed at the um, instrument cluster. I then publish that onto the internet via Twitch or something. And then people can then use TMUX to um, SSH into the Raspberry Pi and I can see what they're doing so they can't do anything really nefarious and it's on a different network anyway. Really um, interesting. So um, yes, we could have it set up one weekend or something or one evening. I know we're global so evening might be a bit um, difficult but um, hmm. yes, it can, it can be used remotely. Um, shouldn't right. be a problem. Well, Ian, can, can um, I borrow a Porsche and do it to one of them? <laughs> yeah, but I think we're talking about a few more ECUs than uh, than thirty. But that's fine. We we can discuss. Um, well, Ian, uh, I need to thank you very much. The discussion is very interesting. And of course, the PDO is really amazing. Um, do you have anything you would like to say before we close? Um, thank you very much for everyone that's listening. Um, again, my contact details are on the screen, hopefully, um, if you want to get in contact, if you want any of the different PCBs I have. Um, I'm actually working on something at the moment that should be something very similar to um, Toyota's Pasta, which is a virtual car in a brief briefcase. But I'm still working on it, keeping on Twitter, and there should be some updates. Um, but I will keep you posted. But, uh, yes, very awesome. Right. Thank you, Ian. Um, just a reminder, next week on Wednesday, we have uh, Threat Q coming in. They're going to be showing us threat analysis, Top Gun style. So come back next week and show the, um, show the, or see the, the next threat modeling tool from Threat Q. 
All right, guys, thank you very much. Have a good evening, good day, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Text me, email me. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.